Welcome to the periodic law review. Um, the test is going to consist of mostly multiple choice, but you will have a table to fill in um, information from the periodic table itself. So let's get started. Uh, you should definitely study your notes, especially if you have not done that flipped lesson. Make sure you get that done because there will be some questions on it. Uh, the review um, and then any worksheets that you got back in class. Um, as always, I suggest you read the chapter, especially if you're having trouble understanding some of the trends. That might help you understand it a little bit. All right, let's get going with the first question. Number one wants to know who made the first periodic table and how was it arranged? This was one of our journal questions and we discussed it. Uh, Mendeleev was the one who um, discovered the, or not discovered, but published the first periodic table. He did that in um, about 1869 is when he did that, so quite a, quite a long time ago. Uh, he first arranged it by atomic mass. Um, he, and when he did, he started to notice that there were properties that repeated each other, so that's how he arranged it. Um, he knew that at that time there was probably a lot of elements that had not been discovered. And so he actually left some blank spaces in the periodic table for um, elements that had not been discovered. And when he did that, he, um, he actually had predicted some of the properties uh, that these undiscovered elements would have. And he was actually remarkably correct on many of them. Um, along came uh, Mosley. And he rearranged the periodic table because the problem with Mendeleev's table was even though he had it arranged, there were some gaps that didn't quite fit his pattern. And so at this time, they had started to discover things about the uh, atoms, such as the nucleus and protons. And he determined that a better way to rearrange that table was through their atomic number. And then he also noticed the patterns as well, and that's where we got that term periodicity, and that's actually where the term periodic table comes from because the properties in the elements appear periodically based on uh, their arrangement. Uh, and that leads us to the periodic law, and the periodic law, periodic law states that the physical and chemical properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. Their similarities can be explained by their electron configuration. Everything in the same group has the same outer configuration. It's just moving in energy levels, and that's why they behave similarly when they're in their groups. Um, on the periodic table, the horizontal rows we call periods. Uh, the vertical columns um, are called groups. One way to help you remember this is um, number four, the periods, just like FHS, the periodic table has seven periods. So that might be one way to, when you get to the test, to remember the difference between period and groups. Uh, number seven wants to know what is the most electronegative element, and it is fluorine. Um, I told you in class that will be a test question. That's the one freebie I give away every single year, and that is fluorine is the most electronegative element. Um, it the trend for electronegativity increases as you go across the period, meaning it's higher on the uh, right side of the period, and it actually decreases um, down a group, which is why fluorine is the highest. Remember, the noble gases do not have an electronegativity value because they have no desire for an electron in a compound, um, and that is the definition of electronegativity, is the ability to attract electrons in compounds. And fluorine is always the winner. If you can think of uh, tug of war and trying to tug of, and get that electron, fluorine always wins. The trend for atomic size is the one that we have trouble with. Um, as you go across the period, it decreases. Okay, so it's actually bigger on this side of the table. Um, if we were looking at period. Uh, Three, where we start with sodium and end with argon. Sodium is actually bigger than argon. And we talked about in class about effective nuclear charge, how every time we add protons, we're adding them to the nucleus, and the nucleus is getting more and more positive, effectively getting stronger. And they act as a collective in the nucleus, and they're pulling on those individual electrons. And so it's, they're getting stronger in the nucleus, it can pull those electrons closer, making the size get smaller. As you go down a group, it gets bigger, and that's because you're adding energy levels. Think of it, um, well, actually, let's draw it. So let's say I have this nucleus, and then I go in period one. I have one energy level. 
I go to period two, I add a different energy level. I go to period three, and I add a third energy level. So every time I'm adding an en energy level, it gets larger and larger and larger, okay? Francium is the largest atom. Helium is the very smallest. Um, the definition and trend for ionization energy, and it wants to know what has the highest ionization energy. I is I, look, I can't say that. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from an atom. So the higher the ionization energy, the harder it is to remove it. So if it has a very high ionization energy, it actually means that its electrons, its valence electrons, are going to be very, very close to the nucleus, and so the nucleus is holding on tighter to them. And so it increases as you go across the period. It's the exact opposite of size. Uh, and it decreases as you go down a group. So the highest ionization energy, I forgot to answer that one, is oops, is helium because it is the smallest atom, so its valence electrons are the closest to the nucleus. So helium is the highest ionization energy. The largest ionization energy would be, francium would be the largest ionization energy. Uh, the next question is want to know what is a cation? Uh, cations, are, remember, are positive. Um, we said that in class. Uh, what happens in a cation is the metals have given away an electron. And remember, they're giving away things that are negative. Um, and so we use the example in class, if I lose weight, I get smaller. So the cations are going to be smaller than the original atom. And so we'll use magnesium as an example. Magnesium is a group 2 element. It has two valence electrons. Um, and so what it does is it's easier to give away two than it is to get uh, six because, remember, everybody's trying to get to eight, trying to get to that octet. And so if it will give away two electrons, it actually has eight valence electrons in its core electrons, making it more stable. So by the fact that it's giving away two, it gets a plus two charge because now it has two extra protons over electrons. Uh, the anions are negative. And what happens in an anion is a non-metal has taken in electrons to get to their eight. Um, and so our example here is oxygen normally has six valence electrons. It's trying to get to eight, so it will take in two. And when it does that, since it has two extra electrons, which are negative, it gives us a negative two charge. Um, to use the weight analogy, when I gain weight, I get bigger. So when I gain electrons, the atom gets bigger. So the anion is actually larger than the original atom. Uh, what are valence electrons and how do you use the periodic table to predict? Um, remember, uh, valence electrons are the uh, outermost S and P orbitals. And so we'll look at those and count those up. So they are the electrons that are involved in bonding. They can be lost, gained, or shared. Uh, in order to get to 8 in that valence shell, because remember, we want that octet. So here's an example of uh, oxygen. And it is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, our outer um, electron, or outer s and p is this 2s and 2p4 for a total of 6 valence electrons. If we're looking at the periodic table, um, actually, when we get to the periodic table a little bit later, we'll go back over this question and predict what we talked about in class. Uh, 14 wants to know why hydrogen is placed separately from the other elements on the periodic table, and that is because it has many unique qualities or properties, so it's set up there by itself. It, ha it has only one valence electron, and so they put it in group one because it has one valence electrons like everything else, but it is not an alkali metal. It's up there by itself along with helium because they're unique in their configuration and their properties. So that's why you have those two lonely ones up there by themselves. Uh, number five wants to know if rubidium has the electron configuration of xenon 5s1, what period is rubidium in and what group is it in? So what this is asking you is you can use uh, the electron configuration right here to figure that out. I mean, obviously you can just look at the periodic table and say, find rubidium, there it is. But by this 5s right here, we can see that, okay, that means, whoops, sorry about that. That means that this is in the fifth period, okay? So we know that we can go find that in the fifth period. S1, anytime, anything that's S1 is going to end up being in group 1. So if you had to figure that out without a periodic table, that is how you could do that using that configuration. But on the test, quite honestly, just go look it up. That makes it a lot easier. 
Uh, 16 just says know the sublevels uh, and where the where electrons are being filled. And we did that back during the last unit. The S block, of course, is groups 1 and 2. The P block is groups 13 through 18 over here. The D block is the middle, transition metals. And the F blocks, of course, are the lanthanide and actinide series at the bottom. Uh, what are some properties of alkali metals? That was in the flipped lesson. Uh, they are soft, silvery metals. Uh, they are the most reactive of the metals. They are, in fact, so reactive that you will never find them existing by themselves in nature. They'll always be bound up in a compound, and that's because they only have that one valence electron in the S1 configuration, and they are trying to get rid of it as quickly as possible so that they can be more stable with their core electrons that are underneath. So here we have um, our periodic table and review it for group names. This is also where we're going to go ahead and talk about um, how to predict valence electrons as well. Um, so first of all, let's talk about the group names. Uh, group 1, of course, is the alkali metals. Uh, group 2, alkaline earth metals. And you might want to pause this video and write all this down because uh, I know I'll talk faster than you can write. Uh, we call groups 3 through 12 the transition metals. And remember, those are the D block. Uh, group 13 and 14 and 15, we don't really give them names. Uh, group 16, we sometimes call the oxygen group, but, but really we don't do that that often. Group 17, of course, is the halogens. They are the most reactive of the nonmetals. Matter of fact, they, the most reactive nonmetals, like to react with group 1, the most active metals. And, of course, group 18, everybody seems to always know that. Uh, just this up here, not the F block is the noble gases. And of course their qualities are that they are unreactive because they have a full octet. Okay, so now let's do our valence electrons um, real quick. So groups one and two, you, they have the same number of valence electrons as their group number. So one and two, same as group number. So group one has one valence electron and group two has two valence electrons. 3 through 12, you'll take, I mean, 13 through 18, I'm sorry, uh, groups 13 through 18, literally you'll just take 10 off, so subtract 10, and that's your number of valence electrons. So like 13 has 3 valence electrons, 18 has 8 valence electrons, etc. Groups thir uh, 3 through 12, because these are like, remember, this is 3D and this is 4S. Okay, so they'll always finish, they'll always fill the 4S before the 3D. So the transition men, metals themselves generally have two valence electrons. Um, we don't learn the exceptions, but there are some that actually have one, but we don't worry about the exceptions. Um, if you have questions about that, uh, make sure you refer to your book under valence electrons. All right, here is our jokes, and today I decided to give you some memes. So I'll let you scroll through these memes as you go. I uh, just want to tell you, please study for the test. It's not a hard test, but if you don't know your trends um, and your definitions, they will get you. The definitions, as always, are important, so please uh, know those definitions that are in this review. All right, I'll let you scroll through. I wonder how many of you will actually get this joke. I got it. I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. This is my kind of fitness right here. And some of you, it may take longer than other of you to get this one. All right. Good luck on the test. I will see you in class.